Welcome to the 613 Beercast. We're on a remote podcast once again, so we've been doing a few of these now, uh, talking to our brewer friends in Toronto and other areas. Uh, it's a great way to be able to talk to people who are not uh, can't get into the same room with them all the time. Um, so today we've got Great Lakes Brewery with us. We've got Mike Lackey, the head brewer, and Peter Bullitt, the owner and chief brewing officer. Um, so we know here in Ottawa, uh, GLB beers are really highly sought after, Karma Sitcha to Lake Effect. We know the beers quite well, but because you guys are in Toronto, or Etobicoke in this case, we don't often get a chance to hear about the people behind the beer. So uh, I'm going to let Mike and Peter sort of introduce themselves, talk about where their background is, how, how long they've been with uh, GLB, and we'll, we'll go from there. Who wants to go first? Uh, I guess I'll go first. Peter, Peter Bullet. Family bought the uh, the brewery in 1991, and uh, I came right away the first uh, week of the transaction. I was 21 years old, <laughs> and got thrown right into it. Learned, uh, had no idea about making beer at that time. Just enjoyed drinking it incredibly, uh, a, quite a bit. <laughs> I like beer. And it's, uh, it was great, uh, you know, sitting around the kitchen table and dad saying, hey, what do you think? Maybe we should get this brewery. And I was like, oh, Jesus, yes. <laughs> Almost immediately phoned up Mike Lackey and said, you know, we're going to, we got some work here, Lackey. Yeah, I just sort of went from the went from the ground up doing deliveries, brewing, milling, tank assembly. We were, you know, riggers because the new equipment was coming all the time and, that yeah, was a great, great start to the uh, great start to the adventure. Mike, uh, Mike. <laughs> so yeah, I went to high school with Peter, well, public school really. So I heard to the grapevine kind of that uh, his dad bought a brewery. I was looking for a summer job, so when we started talking about working, it was uh, I jumped right on it. Again, like Peter, I didn't know anything about making beer. You know, home brewing wasn't too big back 1990. We didn't have the you know, the East Labs and podcasts such as yours, <laughs> you know, no internet. So there wasn't a lot of info out there. So we, uh, you know, we had some, some knowledge from the previous brewmasters, but it was kind of learning on the job. Went through some rough times back then, but it was always a lot of fun. And, um, and we learned quickly, you know, you trial by fire. So through the 90s, we learned about brewing lager uh, as we went through the 2000s, first decade, we started learning about other styles, you know, and as they were coming up to Canada. So I guess the, the next big change, you know, was being a pilot system and really expanding what we were brewing, which probably happened late, you know, 2006, something like that. So, um, yeah, it's been, you know, 26 years I've been with the company, and I wouldn't have it any other way, so. We're still, we're still, uh, we're still learning every day, pretty much. So it's a great, uh, it's been a great career, and uh, it's going to continue. I hope, unless you got some news, Peter. <laughs> uh, maybe the end of this podcast. Yeah, but, right. <laughs> Boiler oh, yeah. words. <laughs> cool. So we have way back in in 1990s, uh, we got the the U.S. kid. That's a, that's a impressive longevity, and now you guys. Our you know, Canadian Brewery of the Year in 2013 and 2014, Ontario Brewery of the Year in 2014, 2015, and 2016. So uh, from back in those days, is that would you ever have? I mean, it's a, it's a cheesy question, but is that sort of what your planning was? Was to to really top of top of notch brewery in Ontario in Canada, or or really was it just we want to do this for fun and and uh, start from start from just for fun? Well, in 1992, Mike and I sat down and we, we laid out this plan. And the plan was to win 2013 Brewery yeah, of the Year. Absolutely. That's right. Yeah. No, uh, back then, honestly, you know, being lager floggers, it was uh, it was really about business and obviously, you know, producing a, a quality beer that was very consistent. And um, trying to, you know, get as many people aware of the brand and getting taps and staying afloat, you know, uh, it was a big move coming 
from our starting point to Queen Elizabeth here, we're almost 30,000 square feet, and basically the small brewery turned into a big one within the first year that we had uh, bought the company. And uh, Mike was, you know, part of that that big move down to Queen Elizabeth, and uh, it was pretty daunting. And we realized that uh, we're not this is we're not joking around here. Like this is serious. <laughs> and you know, like you said, we definitely, you know, we learned a lot of things by screwing up, and we still learn that way. I, I almost every day. <laughs> Something screwed up, and we we like, oh okay. And sometimes we actually repeat our mistakes. You know. <laughs> We uh, we try hard for sure, and everyone everyone really gives a shit around here, so it's good. Excellent. Yeah, I think it's just, uh, just about the passion, keeping it going. Um, certainly, no plans. Uh, you know, not about winning awards or anything like that. And it, what it has happened a couple times is you know it's nice to get, but uh, like Peter says, it's it's a struggle. It really is. You, you just got to stay on top of it. And, and but again, it's so rewarding. So. Uh, it's just rewarding to get through the day, you know, and have a beer and it tastes good. So uh, anything on top of that is just gravy. Gravy. So I know one of the major themes of, of craft brewery is, uh, as well, at least in general, or what I've seen uh, in, in the time that I've been sort of associated or sort of tangentially associated with the, the industry is uh, uh, community involvement and, and just being being around when things happen and, and trying to trying to build that that sort of fan base. What are some of the uh, the key sort of involvements that that uh, GLB gets to gets to participate in? Well, there's I mean specifically in our community, there's a lot that we put on and there's a lot that we participate in. Uh, whether it's from you know Habitat for Humanity, the Food Bank, Franklin Horner, the Furniture Bank. I don't even know them all. The, the Camp Com H, the, the mental health facility. The, there's a women's shelter we we're connected with here too, and they all either you know either helping them out with cash donations or in kind or helping out with events or helping just to promote them throughout different times of the year. And then here at Great Lakes, we have our annual barbecue, our annual pig roast, and then just our you know tap takeovers and our releases that we do here at the brewery. A lot of a lot of neighbors come by just to grab whatever's new in the fridge or that, you know, gets posted out on social media. Uh, people gravitate to that and then pop into the retail store and, you know, chat up with the staff. And I would say if, if that's what your question was, I hope I answered it. Yeah, absolutely. It was, uh, it, for for us, like, we don't get to see a lot of uh, what you guys get involved in in Toronto, of course, because we're not there. So it's just sort of looking for, you know, I give you a chance to sort of talk about some of your your favorite projects or your 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 what what you guys like the the most and get just to sort of let us know I guess out, out in the 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 Ottawa area what, what you guys are, are are having fun with down there. Yeah, I'd say maybe two more specifically to our area our neighborhood of Etobicoke, Swansea, High Park area. Peter and I both grew up in the neighborhood, and you know as big as Toronto is, it is fairly tight still down here in the West End. So, um, you know, if it's the neighborhood pub or pubs around here, or, you know, even the people up at the Tim Hortons kind of ask him, you know, what's the food truck going to be this week? Some of the excitement there, uh, that's always fun. And it's always fun when you're talking about beer too. So um, we kind of have a little city, I would say, within the city and still friends with a lot of people we went to public school with and uh, hang out in the parks you know, and play hockey where we played hockey when we were seven years old. So we've been lucky in that way. You know, obviously not a lot of people get to experience that through their lives. So I've always appreciated that. And uh, it's good to be a part of it. And hopefully you get back a little bit, you know, and you see people excited that this is in their neighborhood and that we came from the neighborhood. is a great film. I wanted to sort of talk a little bit about the, the core brands I mean, and and sort of the shift recently that the, uh, in the core brands that, that have happened. I know my uh, first experience with a GLB was the Devil's Pale Ale. I remember buying that uh, on a on the LCBO shelves before I went up to a cottage and really enjoyed that sitting on a uh, cottage dock. Um, but that has, that has changed a little bit. That's no longer uh, a core brand, and we've done a bit, bit of a rebranding in that. So um, maybe just talk about some of the, the core brands uh, that you guys got a little bit and, and sort of why you settled on those ones. Oh, I'll start. Mike can jump in. You know, we, we had some sort of 
mixed mash of branding, and we we started. We had a couple of cans out at the time, and we were we we're doing still doing a lot of bottling. And we knew that the the shift was going to cans, but we always felt like we should keep the bottles going. And you know, our I, rotating IPA started in bottles, and when we started pushing even heavier towards the cans and leaning away from the bottles, we said, well, we should really solidify and clean up the branding on these on these beers that we've created. And, you know, we knew that uh, we didn't want to put, put our lager back out as sort of our core, if you will. To, when we say core for us around here, it means what we sell at LCBO right. and what we have around sort of full time, more specifically LCBO. So, you know, we, we knew we wanted to have uh, Crazy Canuck. We knew we wanted to change that to the, just to lose the craziness, <laughs> uh, even though we haven't lost any of that around here. But, you know, did some round table and, uh, decided to come up with Pompous as another core brand, and basically it's it is those two beers. If you want to say core, is that, and everything else is sort of rotating in and out. And we just felt that it was time to, like I said, clean up the branding, uh, clean up the cans, and you know theme them the way we did. Mike came up with some ideas with these caricatures of these wacky people, and it just uh, really resonated around here. Like everyone got into it, and the artist knocked it out of the park, and so on and so on. So. These brands sort of kept in that, that theme, and we will at some point go back to bottling. But for the, right now, now it's, it's really uh, it's about the cans and the art and the fun and uh, rotating, having something different all the time around here. Yeah, I'd say as far as the liquid goes and the recipes, kind of was um, for me was traveling down the U.S. You know, and discovering some of the beers in the late 2000s, I guess, mid to late, and trying IPAs going to California drinking beers there and coming back and being excited about it. And luckily, you know, I was lucky enough to have Peter as an owner who said, I don't know what you're talking about really, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, he does know, obviously, but uh, yeah, let's get a pilot system together, you know, let's, let's try and make these beers. And he allowed me to do it, which is pretty good of him because a lot of owners would say, you don't get to work and make money and sit screwing around. But I was able to screw around for a couple of years and, uh, you know, Canuck Recipe and Pappas and uh, and a lot of the IPAs came out of that, uh, out of that system and and a lot of the ideas too, you know, sitting around and having the beer after and, and thinking of the names with uh, everybody else around here. So, yeah, the, the shift was, uh, it was organic, I think, through traveling and just the shift in pallets and... Uh, we try just be on the forefront, you know, stuff in uh, Ontario. Hopefully, we were and we still are. Because we're trying to uh, make the beer better every day. So you've definitely earned the reputation of being sort of the hop expert in Ontario. Uh, the 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 amount of IPAs that you guys have come out and how well you guys really exercise the use of the hops and and, and really are showcasing them when when you use them. Um, I imagine that sort of it sounds like that sort of took root in your travels, Mike, when you went through the U.S.? Yeah, for sure. Those were the, the first beers that, you know, that really jumped out at me, I would say, ever in my life. It just seemed like such a different thing. And, yeah, so it became a focus, I guess, for me. And um, so that, that's where it came from, yeah, early trips to Fatheads and Cleveland. And um, before that, California, uh, Michigan tours, you know, having the two-hearted down at Bell's. Um, those were all kind of eye-opening moments, and um, yeah, I came back and tried to do something like that, and you know, hopefully better in some cases or different at least. And yeah, and then the rotating IPAs, kind of the idea is keep a similar malt bill, don't have a big change, but really try to focus on how different hops can be. As you get new hops come in, you smell them, it's like, well, that that's really a different beer. You know, there's a lot of similarities, but. But to me, there's uh, more differences and similarities. So it's exciting to use all the different ones, and uh, and yeah, hopefully people enjoy the little subtle differences that are that are quite significant. I think at, at times. Well, for sure, and I mean that, that's that's the, the perfect lead, and that's where I was kind of going with this. Obviously, was that the IPA project that you guys have, have, have just announced? Um, like I say, I mean, Karma Citra makes it up here. When Th when Thrust made it up here, it, it made quite a big splash. Uh, we we definitely enjoy the IPAs that make it uh, up to us from from the Toronto area. And uh, you know, I know Thrust was was getting lineups down there at the brewery. Uh, you know, people it was selling out the uh, same day when you guys went out, put it out on sale. So 
you know, definitely there's there's a well earned reputation there for for knowing how to handle hops, um, and we're really interested in, in this IPA project and what's what's coming up. So I, I just wanted to talk a little bit maybe about the the releases in the IPA project. I give you a chance to, to sort of talk about which ones are your favorites or which ones you're looking forward to the most. For me, I'd say the, the session IPAs is what I I love the most just because you can have so damn many of them and not not get too buzzed. And it just I find it so refreshing and so enjoyable just to to drink. Primarily, yeah, for me, primarily the the session. Only like I said, only because you can have so many. You can have so many at one time, right? Which I like to do, and not get too uh, too hammed up. Lackey, what do you think uh, about the lineup? It's it's pretty aggressive, but uh, we're we're looking forward to having some fun. Yeah, it's kind of something that I thought would be a good idea. Actually, I'm looking at a we're in the LCBO planning office. And from about four years ago, there's some doodles on the wall, and I, I kind of had the thought to do a uh, rotating IPA. Logistically, it's a little difficult uh, with the LCBO, especially, um, just the way they uh, have their listings, you know. So um, that was a bit of a challenge, but the LCBO department here kind of worked with them, and they, because of some of the success of some of them, because of uh, great customers such as yourself, they maybe uh, bent some of their rules, hopefully, or changed some, and uh, they've allowed us to do um, kind of some rotating IPAs. So uh, one thing I'd add about the IPAs, too, is that I was saying that you find a different hop, and it, then you have a different IPA. But sometimes we've had such a great name, like Octopus Wants to Fight, I think, right. which Troy Birch came right. up with is only a good name. But then you have to find a hop to make a new IPA. So sometimes it can go the other way. <laughs> uh, but, yeah. That was one of the, the things that we really enjoyed about uh, uh, that, too, is that the various characters and, and caricatures, almost, that you guys uh, get on your, your beers, and they each seem to have a, a, a distinct personality. Um, that, that video that you guys sent out for the, the Tank 10 uh, sort of uh, evolution was, was a lot of fun. Is that sort of a, like a marketing exercise, or has that just got you guys having a, a, a ton of fun and then, and then putting it on the can? Yeah, it's a it's a bit of both. It's uh it's kind of tongue in cheek and what we call I guess like stupid humor. Just uh just because it's it's really funny and uh, it makes absolutely no sense. But you know, but when you taste the beer, it makes it makes everything sort of come into perspective that you know these guys are whack, but man, they can make good beer. Yeah, I think it's it's kind of about. For me, at least for us, you know, it's, it's about fun, and beer is fun. Uh, so a lot of times, beer can get a little pretty too serious, I think. You know, it's a serious business. We take our job seriously, but as far as the recipes... And you don't the take your job seriously. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> People around here do that. But the write-ups and stuff, you know, to have a little fun with it, and everybody have a little fun, and uh, enjoy the beer. And we try to make complex beer, but uh, bottom line, it's, it's nice and clean, and, uh, and it's fun. As sort of I alluded to with that question, we we talked about the the the, the video, and your just your uh, sort of changing of, of the Tank Ten program, and I kind of want to touch on on Tank Ten a little bit. Start with what sort of where it started from, like what what were the origins of Tank Ten, and and, and sort of the history behind that. So our fermenter number ten at the brewery has the ability to, to cool. The dimple jacket of the of the cone. Sorry, we we're oh, able gosh. able to cool the cone, which allowed us to do smaller batches. So when we started Tank Ten, you know, we were only doing like 2,000, 3,000 liter batches at the time. Uh, so that was the only tank we'd actually put it in. So I told Mike and the guys, I was like, well, well, we'll keep that tank reserved, and you guys just do whatever the hell you want in there. But maybe let me know. And a lot of times they don't. <laughs> so they just, uh, you know, come up with a a recipe or a style that they wanted to try and just go for it. And we'd either bottle, can, keg, or both, and started to get a following for it. So, you know, Tank 10 kind of grew up, and the batch grew from 3,000 to 5,000, and then from 5,000 to 10,000 liters. And then, you know, launching at LCBO, and then Tank 10, you know, we had we had to borrow Tank 11. So, kind of the, so the, I guess the... Uh... The fact is, it is not tank ten. It is not tank ten anymore because it's tank ten through fifteen presently. Right. <laughs> so that's what we're doing. For anniversary, just thirtieth anniversary beers uh, stemming from tank ten, which stemmed from Project X, which was just our little pilot system. So it's uh, it's been organic growth 
for the for the brands, which I think is good and healthy. So, yeah, we'll see where it goes from here. I, I don't know what marketing's plan is, but uh, I'm sure it'll be more than just tank ten, just the one tank in the future. But uh, hopefully, April was uh, wants to know here is what, what was your tank ten favorite? Well, which was the best? The, the, if you if you had one, like which one would you guys say that this this is the my favorite tank ten that I wish I could do all the time? I got a bunch, and I I think. My ultimate favorite is the one that people lined up for, which was quite a few of them. No, I'm just no. Again, for me personally, I'd go to the session. The session IPA is only, like I said, because the the drinkability and the uh, and the ability to to spread that around. Somebody that that doesn't really like high hoppy beers or even IPAs, they they try the session IPA and they just it, it's like it's so delicious and so easy to drink that. It's almost like you know the blonde lager of uh, 1990. It's just so so yummy. But all the IPAs really, and I mean, there's not many of our beers. I don't think there's any of our beers that I don't like. <laughs> so it's kind of uh, it's a tough question. You get asked that a lot. It's uh, I was finding hard to say one. Oh, I, uh, I completely understand that. You guys got you guys do a lot of good beers. I I would be hard pressed actually to to pick up a favorite myself. But it's 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 one of those fun questions that you ask and 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 see if somebody can has an answer or or at least you get to kind of find out what kind of styles people like. Very often, my my favorite one is the one that's on tap in the front. Yeah, in the retail store because <laughs> that's the current. Yeah, if I had to pick a tank ten, I'd maybe stick with you. The Limp Puppet would be probably my top. So when it's out, I'll drink that. But other times of year, I, I drink the Canuck almost exclusively. Uh, I like I like the IPAs, of course, but like Peter's been saying, when you're kind of when you're in the business and you're you know you're drinking a bit, at, you know, for fun and for and for work, you try to keep the alcohol a little lower. So um, Canuck's my go-to, but but uh, tank ten wise, it would probably be the Lim Papa would be my top. We're talking about some of the these harder to find beers a little bit, and especially up here in Ottawa, they don't always make make it all all, all up here. So, I, have you guys been aware of the the Ottawa reputation that you guys got, and 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 how how sort of the the, the group of us here that that uh, are are beer hunters in the Ottawa LCBOs, and we'll, we'll try and we'll we'll drive around the city trying to find out which one's stalking you. Yeah, for sure. We get uh, we have conversations with our LCBO guys uh, all the time, and they tell us like sometimes just like you won't believe it. This LCBO just sold right out of whatever whatever was out there, and we do see um, we do see basically by by number and on social media. Uh, Troy gives us updates all the time of the guys, you know, tweeting out or he'll share uh, compliments about what you know what guys are saying out out your way and. So we do we do have we do have a bit of a sense, but obviously when you when you have direct conversations with people, that's when you get a little more emotionally tied to it. Like just to hear numbers and that's definitely a great thing. But when you hear or get emails with direct comments or uh, you know, somebody actually picks up the phone and says, Hey man, I like I like what's going on out here. It's great. And then we've got we've got some great bars that support us uh, out out as well. Brothers, the Wellington Gastro, Cheshire Cat. Yeah. And uh, the Union Six One Three, so we don't we don't have a big tap list out there, but that that's kind of growing organically too because we don't currently have a sales rep in the region. Right. Yeah, I would say right from the start of like way back when we did Crazy Canuck, uh, which would have been 2010. For me, I'm a I'm into the culture, you know, and 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 like you guys are, like like we're talking about. So I like paying attention to where there's an obvious like. Um, a group of people who are into you know into the beer, and so right from the start, I kind of come upstairs, you know, every every once in a while, and ask you know who's going through a lot of beer, what LCBOs, what cities, and other than Toronto, obviously uh, where we are, anyways, so that's kind of cheap. Uh, <laughs> Ottawa has always been a big supporter, taken a lot, and uh, the other one would be London, really, that kind of centers that. I mean, there's others too, but Ottawa, right from the beginning, has been big supporters of of the stuff we were trying to do. You know, even at the at the beginning, we were still learning. Maybe it wasn't perfect, but I feel like uh, Ottawa has always been a big supporter and continue to be so. Obviously, yeah, I think the the Ottawa scene too is growing quite rapidly now. I'm wondering, are you guys seeing any more? Difficulty finding space here in Ottawa with all of the locals coming up in the area. Uh, 
No, we've had no negative feedback from stores saying, you know, we're full or we're pulling back. You know, as long as we can keep it up, I think the, the quality of our beer and the uh, the handsomeness of our salespeople <laughs> will continue to uh, keep the beer on the shelves. <laughs> Seems like just people are buying more beer, you know. Like, it's great that there's, uh, it's not like the competition takes away from too much. It seems like everybody, at least presently, you know, is, is growing. So I, I think we're seeing bigger numbers, just like everybody else is uh, right now. So uh, Ontario was quite a bit behind, so just along, there's still, there's still room to grow for more breweries and uh, more good beers. That's, that's, good. that's what I, I'd hope to hear. Is I, I also am a big proponent of that. We've got a lot of room for, for, for good beer and and. Ontario, like you said, is a little bit behind, and, and we've got a lot of growing to sort of catch up. And it would be, it would be disappointing to see them this to be sort of tightened too by too much competition. I'd, I I think there's enough room for for everybody to to have a good beer from different people all the time. But this year is it's a big year for you guys. Num- number thirty, you guys have been there for quite a bit of that, but not the full thirty years. But what have you guys seen over those thirty years in the industry? What have really sort of changed everything yeah <laughs> yeah everything really. if you're uh you know sort of late 20s and up you'll know what, what's changed yeah that's true <laughs> shopping habits of how you take empties has changed you're you know you got way more cans in your fridge than ever and uh you know you like to peruse around brands like we're as delicious as we think, we know that you know we're part of the rotation with a lot of other great brewers, and I think that's one thing that you know people in Ontario love to do is they just they shop the whole category, which is awesome. You know, fill up a basket at LCBO with you know four or five or six different brands for either a night with some friends or just to stock the fridge or just to have some fun. I would say from a brewing perspective that biggest change and when I think about it you know it's like it's almost as big a change as cell phones and stuff from a brewing perspective is is uh, yeast phase internet apps because back then when we started as I kind of touched on before there was no yeast phase so and and the no one was really no one was helping with you with yeast if you started a brewery back in 1990 like the big big guys they didn't want to help they had their yeast and that was their proprietary and you couldn't get that yeast and they didn't want to help you. I can't blame them. So we got yeast from Europe. And, you know, if you were kind of brewing a few batches and you're, you're doing the uh, you're harvesting, doing a few generations, and your yeast starts going a little, a little funny, we had to get on the phone and get a plane coming from Europe to the suite or get something on a plane from Europe. So, you know, in recipe generation and stuff, everything was, you know, with calculators and figuring out IBUs and... So the internet, having access to kind of recipe ideas, like what a change from uh, back then when we were just we were in the dark, really, and just learning from. And if you if you had a you could bring someone in, you know, who had Molson experience, brewmaster, you know, you just sucked up every word that he had to that he offered and every bit of knowledge because uh, it was gold. So I, I think to me that's the biggest change uh, on the brewing side. Hey, bringing bringing people in, that's a could a great transition to the, the 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 next sort of topic I was wanted to talk about a bit. You guys have got a lot of collaborations planned for your thirtieth. Do you, you got any sneak peeks for us about what uh, might be coming down the pipe uh, with some of those co- collabs? Yeah, I guess the next one to come out is the one we did with Amsterdam, the Ezra, and uh, we've got a lot of that beer in uh, barrels, and I think that was you know part of the fun that we have here. And this is this is what we did. Oh, and yeah, West Avenue, of course, gave us uh, gave us the barrels or some of the barrels to put the uh, the beer in. But we had a big crew from Amsterdam come to Great Lakes, and we sat around the table, and uh, it took Mike about an hour, but he got a sample of all fourteen barrels. I think it was fourteen. Four, fourteen different barrels. We sat around the table with about ten or so of us tasting every barrel to make sure that it was up to par to to make the blend and. Everyone had scorecards and you know had dry crackers for in between the uh, in between the sampling, and that was a lot of fun. And you know to be able to have those guys come in and get their opinion on on the barrels and tasting notes and just the the camaraderie. And I think 
you know, for Great Lakes, we are friends with probably 98% of all the breweries in Ontario and, and, and a ton outside of Ontario. And I think, you know, when we ask to do a collab, it's, there's, there's no, um, there's no ego. There's no, there's no bullshit. It's just like, let's get some friends together and make a damn good beer and celebrate doing it together both at the start and when it comes off the comes off the line uh another one we're doing or just put in the tank is uh one we've done before beer to zeus which was interesting because when we first did it it was um with kyle taker uh who was a homebrew at the time who won a homebrew competition toronto beer week homebrew competition and uh, uh we selected it out of you know blind and he actually his beers won four out of the five categories or something like that. Uh, a, he was a fairly new homebrew at the time. What year was it? 2012. So NRAD won the homebrew. He came in. He's a great guy. So we um, we did that beer with him. It was it turned out awesome. I think it's still tasting good. We cracked a bottle the other day or yesterday. Now he's started a little brewery, Half Hours on Earth, up in Seaforth. So we thought this year would be a good chance to get him back, maybe get a better promotion for his little brewery, which doesn't need a lot because he's got a lot of buzz going about the cool beers he's making. But uh, he came down yesterday, Tuesday, a couple of days ago. It's, all like it's, been, it's been a long week. <laughs> and uh, he uh, he came down, so we did, we did that collab too. So that's in the fermenter now. Uh, it'll be going into bourbon barrels and released sometime in the late fall, I think. Yeah. Uh, something like that. So that'd be another one. There's some uh, new breweries around that we've talked to about doing collabs. I, yeah, I, it would probably be a couple others, but uh, we're not sure. It's actually brings up an interesting mentioning uh, half hours on earth. I, uh, it, it's not a question I, I, I had planned to ask, but it did bring bring it up because we had a previous podcast ab- about mail ordering beer. Is that something you guys ever thought about for uh, the the more remote? cities or, or, or the, 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 the smaller release beers that you can only get at the brewery uh, to give people like us here in Ottawa a chance to so order it and have it shipped to us. Is that, is that ever a, a business model you guys you thought about or, or are thinking about? Uh, honestly, no. And for no other reason than, you know, it, it does sell out pretty quickly out of our retail store just for the neighborhood. And often still when we do do a release and put on social media, there's uh, not, not always a lineup, but there's a good, good, steady flow, and generally the beer lasts just a couple of days. So it'd be hard to section off and say, "All right, let's uh, let's do ten cases or five cases of mail order." It just seems like it almost wouldn't be fair to do some. <laughs> like, how do you sort of cut it off? And then online, you say, "Oh, it's sold out." I I don't know. I I just think it's easier uh, to do those releases just here out of the brewery. Uh, unless unless we're able to get them to be bigger, but then if they're bigger, we're generally putting them out to, L- to LCBO. So it's kind of it's kind of tricky. And now that LCBO can can do the uh, you know the home delivery or the mail-in delivery, if there is something that's only sort of in Toronto, but for the most part we send everything out to Ottawa. So I I don't know. Yeah, no, that 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 uh, makes perfect sense to me. I was I, I, that was one of our theories as well is that you know the smaller breweries in smaller cities it makes a lot of sense for them. But these bigger breweries and bigger cities probably have enough foot traffic and enough local traffic that the, the mail order just is probably not going to make as much sense. Uh, and you're just kind of validated our yeah. theory, really. So I, I, I do. I know you guys are are, are uh, got to wrap up uh, soon. So I, I do have a, a, a write-in question uh, that I wanted to, ta- to ask, uh, though, real quick. Um, I was asked to ask about your biggest disaster in the early days. There's there's been a few. Uh, I almost got killed once. That was that was pretty pretty big. Yeah, I rinsed my hands with caustic ones too. No, I uh, yeah, I was checking some electrical on the brew house, and I it was because the the meter was wired up wrong, and I uh, I decided that it'd be a good idea to see if the meter is working and, and check the main, which was 600 volts, 200 amps, and uh, it blew up in my face, and I got thrown back about eight feet up against the tank, and uh, I thought I was blind because I had light light shock or what like you get from welding you get light struck i think is the term right so that that was uh, that was pretty bad yeah yeah i once was checking if there was caustic in water and I, I shouldn't have used my bare hand i almost lost all my skin 
Oh man. Uh, I got. Uh, so <laughs> back in the first year, uh, wait. So after they got uh, Peter's family got the brewery, uh, I came on the first summer, and as we said, we didn't know much about it. We were just learning on the job, and it, everybody kind of came down here. Anybody who had more knowledge than we did, and we were probably not ready for it. And we had an electric uh, kettle up there with elements. And if you were draining the kettle, you'd have to turn those elements off or you'd singe the beer. So uh, we forgot, or maybe I forgot probably, to turn them off and it singed the beer and we fermented it. And it was like, this tastes like barbecued beer. It was kind of burnt. <laughs> and then I'm like, yeah, it's not too bad though. Maybe we're all right. So we sent it to aging. And then we left the, gly or the glycol system messed up and it froze like solid. So we burnt it and we froze it, and then we tasted it. And we're like, okay, that's not. Good. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not. No, that one, uh, that one didn't make it out. But I remember that being like, are you joking? But yeah. But the fact is that you know nothing quite kind of that bad happens much anymore. But there are things that there's stuff that happen that are out of your control sometimes, and you you deal with stuff like that all the time. Like every week, we'll have some something not like that, but. Yeah. You're just like, are you joking? Like, yeah. Come on, this yeah. one's cursed. This wasn't meant to be, or something, you know. Uh -oh. That's most people. I mean, you have bad days. Well, just as a, a quick wrap up, I know we wanted to talk a, a, a bit more about your your 30th anniversary, and a little bit more about uh, Project X. But we guys, we're we're planning a trip up to come see you guys, and so we're we're planning a, a, a part two of this podcast. We're hoping to to be able to sit down with you guys in your uh, area there. And uh, talk a little yeah. bit more about part uh, about uh, the thirtieth anniversary. So, uh, I look forward to visiting you guys soon. Oh, that's gonna be great. Cool. Look forward to it too. Thanks. Thanks very much for spending some time with us and and giving us some insight into the the people behind uh, GLB. You're very welcome. Thank right. you as well. All right. Thanks, Chuck. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Come join the conversation at 613 Beercast After Dark on Facebook, 613 Beercast on Twitter, and 613 Beercast on Instagram. And we'll talk to you next week. Yeah.